Okay, so our ranching mason bees and a bit about other stem nesting bees. Uh, there's actually 4,000 different bee species nationwide and 450 uh, different bee species just in New York State, right? Which, which is kind of fascinating, right? Uh, usually you just see a bee and you think they're all the same, but in fact, uh, there's quite a variety. Uh, so, um, like you said, uh, uh, I have my own, ah, I own Blossom Meadow Farm and co-own Coffee Pot Cellars, which is uh, a tasting room. Um, my husband's a winemaker. Uh, so we have both of our businesses in one store um, out in Kuchog, and the address is down there, 31855 Main Road. Um, my actual farm location is in South Hold on South Harbor Road, but we thought it'd be good to have a farm store. Uh, and everything that I talk about tonight is also available on my website, which is blossommeadow.com. And I have a lot of great articles uh, as well as videos um, on that website. And this video tonight will be posted there as well. So uh, my main uh, focus for the farm is growing berries, right? So we specialize in growing black raspberries, red raspberries, strawberries, and blueberries. Uh, and from that, we make jam. We actually won the National Good Food Awards uh, for our strawberry and red raspberry jam uh, this past year. So we're pretty psyched about that. Uh, no pectin, just great um, berries boiled down. Uh, and really, this jam really celebrates the fruits of all of these bees, right? That they're the ones that work so hard to make the fruit. So I love that, you know, um, the native bees made this jam. All right, well, you know, I remember as a kid sitting in the back of my parents' car and there was so much uh, bug schmutz on the windshield, right? And so then my parents would stop at the gas station to clean the windshield and they would say, hey, we're here, we might as well get some gas too. Right now you go to the gas station and every once in a while they'll clean your windshield, but really it's a vestige of yesteryear. There are not as many bugs as there used to be. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it, forget all the graphics, just thinking about when you're a kid uh, to now it's, it's pretty striking. Right. So what that means is that there's less uh, free pollination um, going on than there used to be because there are fewer bees, all right? So since there are fewer pollinators, we need to maximize their efficiency. And with native pollinators, they're not domesticated, right? We need to coax them and manage them and get them to nest where we want them to pollinate, right? So that means our fruit trees, our backyard gardens, um, our areas in general. And there are ways that you can get, get them to do that. Well, everybody has heard of honeybees, right? Uh, but there are also pollen bees. So since I'm an ecologist, I think of uh, honeybees as one category and then pollen bees as another category. Then within pollen bees, you have bumblebees, ground nesting bees, and cavity nesting bees. Now, earlier I said there's 450 different bee species in New York State. Roughly 70% are ground nesting bees, which includes cellophane bees, longhorn bees, sweat bees, mining bees, there, there are so many. And then cavity nesting bees uh, include carpenter bees, which I'm sure everybody's kind of nodding their head, smiling a little bit because a lot of people know about carpenter bees. But it also includes yellow face bees, wool carters, leaf cutters, and mason bees. Now this is not a full list. This is, these are just a few examples. Um, in the slides I show you, uh, we're going to go more in depth about wool carters, leaf cutters, and mason bees, which are all in the mega chylid family of bees. So first off though, solitary bees are really gentle. They're such sweethearts. Of all of the bee species, it's only female bees that sting. Boys don't sting at all, right? Because they're just built differently. But of solitary bees, the females don't want to sting you. And the reason is the same female that goes to collect food is also laying an egg, right? So her body is so important that she doesn't want to get in fight, into a fight with you and possibly die, right? So 
over here, this is a female mason bee. And over here, this is a male mason bee. Now you can tell because the male mason bees are furry on their faces and they have longer antennas. The females, shorter antennas, not so furry on their faces. And they just have uh, a little bit larger, um, like more oval bodies. Right? Now, wool carters. The, oh, and all these pictures were taken right here on Long Island, which I think is pretty cool, right? So this is a European wool carter bee. And wool carters, just like their name assumes, they card or scrape the fluff off, say, a lamb's ear leaf. And then they take that fluff and puts it into a hollow plant stem to, uh, you know, surround their bee babies, right? <laughs> this is a, also a wool carter bee. This is actually from my yard. And uh, you can tell by this bee that they're also furry on their underside, which is a chief um, uh, identifier of a bee in the megachylid family. They are furry on their undersides. And what's so great about that is that they carry tons of pollen with them, right? And you can definitely see it here. Uh, these, this bee is on butter and eggs, which some people see as a weed. But to me, if it's flowering, it's a wildflower. So here are leaf cutter bees. Now leaf cutters, you can tell these are leaf cutters because they are black and white striped. And again, look how much pollen is on all of them, right? So they are also furry on their undersides. So again, they belly flop onto the flower. Now uh, leaf cutter bees are pretty interesting because what they do is they cut circles out of the side of a leaf, right? And then they take those uh, circles and they put them into a hollow plant stem or any cavity and swaddle their bee babies with it. Like, does that just make you smile? I don't know, I love it. <clears throat> so <clears throat> here is a, a really neat picture. On top, you see um, bee babies from a leaf cutter bee, right? And then in the center here, these are resin bee babies. And now you can tell these are resin bees because see how their um, uh, separators is actually a uh, tree resin. And the reason why they use tree resin is because during when it's cold out, right, it really protects their babies from predators. But these bees will emerge in the summer when it's warmer. So all, then the warmer temperatures make that resin a little bit gooey. And so then the adult bee can emerge, right? And then on the bottom, as you've probably guessed, these are mason bees down here. And mason bees, just like their name assumes, they actually take mud to plug up uh, where they laid their baby, all right? Mason bees, which uh, everybody's probably heard a lot about. And I gotta say, I do love them. Um, in part because they are just, um, it's kind of neat. Like when people get emotionally attached to something, then they want, uh, then they want to plant more things in their yard, right? Uh, uh, food, right? Flowers, shrubs, trees. And by helping one species, then all of a sudden you're restoring your entire yard and then your whole neighborhood because other creatures will use it as well. Now this is a male mason bee uh, on canola, right? Um, so. There are multiple species of mason bee on Long Island. Um, I think there's like 12. Uh, but the ones that we use for bee ranching are the blue orchard mason bee, Osmia lignaria, and um, the horn-faced mason bee, Japanese horn-faced mason bee is kind of like intermixed in there and that's Osmia cornifrons. Um, the Japanese horn-faced bee was brought to the United States in the 1970s from Japan um, uh, for apple pollination and now it's kind of naturalized out here. But uh, the mason bee here, Osmia lignaria, is native, right? So horn-faced is naturalized, but the blue orchard mason bee is native. Uh, so this is my farm. And um, right here is our barn. And you see, uh, uh, facing south right here. Can you see my pointer? 
Yeah. Okay, good. So um, this is the eastern side of my barn. And you see here, these are all my bee cottages. You want to put your bee cottage facing east, southeast, so it gets the morning sun, right? So then the bees warm up faster and then they are more active, right? Bees don't have a lot of um, uh, fat on them, right? So they use the sun to warm them up um, uh, more than anything else. And uh, this is all canola right here. Uh, I grow this cover crop specifically to feed these bees. There's just something life-giving about uh, feeding the, the tummy of a bee. Uh, and I go out every morning uh, when they're flying uh, and then my husband calls me in for breakfast. So I, I really enjoy it. Um, and interestingly, um, mason bees see blue really well, right? Which is why the bee cottages are um, painted blue, right? They found that um, mason, bee, mason bees are attracted to blue the most. And then if they're attracted to it, then they will be more productive, right? So they'll have more babies. Um, and interestingly, I've actually seen mason bees kind of fly up to this roof, right? So, because it is a blue roof. Um, I would think that they would stay more to the ground, but they just seem to really love that color. So mason bees are great pollinators of spring flowering crops. Uh, in the spring, um, as you guys know, that's when the fruit trees bloom, right? So you have apple, pear, plum, apricot, peaches, cherry, um, strawberry uh, blooms. You know, I have um, uh, June bearing strawberries and uh, they're pollinating them as well. And then my early uh, cultivars of blueberry, uh, the mason bees will pollinate. This is a picture of uh, a horn-faced mason bee that I took at Surrey Lane. I have a pollination contract there uh, with my mason bees for their apricots and apples uh, and nectarines. And uh, yeah, I mean, I have a pretty crummy camera and uh, I was out here for like four hours, but I had a blast, you know? And so I was like so proud of this photo, you know? Um, granted, it's not a blue orchard mason bee. I have another picture of that one, but uh, this just, I don't know, when you see that male just going in and just like so excited for that flower, it's fabulous, right? Uh, so the thing is in the early spring, right? That's when it's cold and rainy a lot of times. A lot of bees don't like to fly in the early spring because of that, uh, especially honeybees. They're actually really uh, boring and lame. They're not hard workers. And so mason bees though, since they only live for pretty much 30 days, uh, they are working every single day. And so a lot of times they're really the only uh, bee that you'll see out. Uh, oh, um, kind of a tangent, but this spring, you know how maple trees are one of the first things that blooms, right? Um, look to see who's pollinating the, those flowers. And um, I think you will be surprised. You probably will see some mason bees, but you will also see flies. Flies are actually pollinators as well. So um, uh, mason bees, leaf cutters, wool carters, all these megachylid bees uh, are perfect pollinators. And uh, like I said before, they uh, are furry on their underside. So you see how they have scopa right here, right? And this bee just looks like a Cheeto, right? With all the, the pollen that's on him. Now, uh, honeybees, on the other hand, they are efficient pollen collectors, right? They carry it in pollen, bath the pollen in pollen baskets on their legs. But they are poor pollinators because it doesn't fall off of them, right? So um, actually, honeybees are, pretty crummy in many ways, but they are pollen hoarders. And um, they found that a honeybees, um, uh, 40 honeybee hives uh, will hoard as much food for, I think it's 4 million solitary bees, right? The, the food equivalent, right? So, um, and they found that with honeybee hives, um, bumblebees that are in close proximity the, uh, to a honeybee hive, the bumblebees are actually smaller in size and produce fewer bee babies, and that's because of competition for food, right? So, so um, you know, to me on my farm, I got rid of my honeybees uh, years ago because the native bees uh, do a better job. They pollinate two to three times better 
than honeybees do. And uh, they actually found that because of how they pollinate, and like I said, belly flop onto the flower, they do a better job of pollinating the flower and you could get heavier, more, more well-rounded fruit and then a higher yield per acre. Like, oh, this is interesting. Um, have you ever seen at the grocery store misshapen fruit, right? Like um, a wonky looking apple or orange, you know, where all the wedges aren't the same size, right? They just look off. Well, you know, the reason why those um, fruits uh, are not perfectly round is because that side of the flower was not pollinated, right? So I can get more premium, beautiful looking fruit by using the right pollinator. So that's why I solely rely on native bees now to uh, make all of my crops. Um, in fact, may, um, uh, let me see, mason bees are so good at pollinating that USDA suggests per acre of apples, 625 mason bees or two honeybee hives. Oh, this is all per acre or two honeybee hives, which equates to about 120,000 honeybees. So per acre of apples, would you want 625 mason bees or 120,000 honeybees? I think that really says it all, right? And they're just such diligent workers and they're super cute. So um, food, right? Uh, dandelions are also food, right? They bloom in the early spring. This is a picture of a male mason bee, uh, blue orchard mason bee. And you can tell that it's a male again because of those long antennas. But uh, this one just emerged from its cocoon and was just flew down, saw the uh, dandelion and started noshing away, right? Um, so again, to me, anything that's blooming is a wildflower. It's a good way of looking at things, right? So uh, your goal for anybody's goal for their yard really should be to cover uh, it with more than 40% with uh, wildflowers, shrubs, and trees. You know, and with the way things are going, I say even up that number it, um, even more. This is a, a friend of mine. She moved into this uh, property and it was all lawn. And um, through time, this is what she created. And it's just amazing to see how it changes over time, right? But uh, with, for myself, I, I give myself like little goals, right? You don't wanna take on too much. Uh, and to me, all this is uh, your fun experiment, right? So this is your path forward and you should do it any way you want. All right, so we talked about food. Food is the most important thing, right? If we don't have food, you're not gonna do too well in life and the bees are the same way. So next, placing the bee cottages. Now, like I said before, uh, you wanna face them east, southeast. You can put them on a pole or something like that but what they found is that if you put the mason bee um, cottage on uh, like a shed or a barn or something like that, the bees have an easier time finding their house, right? So uh, for my pollination contracts, I do have them on a stack of um, boxes, right? But at our farm, like I said, I put them on the barn itself. Uh, but Again, you can put them in a few different locations and see how it works for you, but they have recently found that um, putting them onto something works well. Uh, and uh, here is a picture of a female mason bee, and you can tell she's a female there, and see on the bottom how she's got pollen, right? So females, uh, they actually um, go for about 35 collection trips of pollen to feed one baby, right? I mean, it's pretty amazing to think of how much pollen they're, they're bringing back. Uh, so here we talked about where you put the bee cottage, but let's talk about the nesting tubes themselves. Years ago, I did an informal experiment where I looked at um, uh, mason bee blocks, which is really how the whole industry started, versus paper tubes, versus the nesting reeds. And, um, what I found um, is that they like the blocks the least, right? even though you see this one is totally full, but they like the blocks the least. And then the paper tubes are pretty much even with that. And then they love the nesting reeds. 
Now, what I figure is um, these blocks are too, the holes are all too similar. So a lot of times the female will go in one uh, tube thinking that it's her tube, but then she'll come out and go into the next one, right? So these are all too similar. And then the paper tubes, they're too similar too. Uh, whereas the reeds, these nesting reeds, they all look a little bit different. And um, what you do is you even bring a few out, right? So then they also uh, have, you know, they have depth, uh, a difference in depth as well. But the mason bees can really figure out which one is theirs uh, because they all look so different. And here is a female um, that's on her mason bee tube. And as you see, some are uh, pushed back a little bit, others are closer up. Uh, and this is kind of neat. Um, so here, they're cavity nesters, right? Now, they don't just live in hollow plant stems. They are just looking for a nice place to live, right? Just like people. People just want to have some great dinners, right? And they want a nice place to live. And the bees are the same way. So um, a bee rancher friend of mine, Anita Garahan, was just about to use this extension cord. And then she saw that on the bottom, a mason bee actually put her egg in there, right? So this is Osmia pumila, which is uh, another one of the native mason bees that's on Long Island, but pretty snazzy, huh? I mean, so just uh, pretty ingenious that, you know, everybody's just looking for a nice place. So with the um, bees, uh, since we were talking about how um, pollinator populations have declined, bee populations, insects in general, 96% uh, of our terrestrial birds uh, are, uh, it feed their babies insects, right? Because they're so high in protein. So uh, I think this is my, my thoughts are that, that because um, insect populations are decreasing and birds want those insects, there's going to be an increased predation pressure on your mason bees, right? Because they want to feed their babies. So now what I've been telling everybody to do is to take um, some uh, chicken wire and billow it over the top of your bee cottage, right? And then keep the reeds with the rubber bands around them. And so then that way, if a bird does come, they'll have a very difficult time taking these tubes out and then eating the, the bee babies that are in them, all right? And that's really just in the last three years that I've started doing that after learning the very hard way. So uh, with mason bees, just like their name assumes, they need mud. And uh, we're not talking like the soil that's in your garden. Instead, you wanna have the dirt that's under your oak tree, right? Like the kind of mud that we all played with as kids making mud pies, right? Uh, so it has a, um, a small fee size, right? So um, where you can uh, take it and squish it and it stays together, right? Whereas like it, it with sand, it would all just kind of fall apart. Now what I do is, um, even though mason bees, they really like to just go to the mud that we have um, in a dirt pile, um, but I also give them buckets of mud. So I took Lowe's buckets because Lowe's are blue buckets, right? Uh, the five gallon buckets, and then you drill a hole halfway up, right? And then by doing that, let's see if I have a pen here. Oh yeah, okay, so, so what you wanna do, can you see that? Okay, so you drill a hole halfway up on the bucket, and then you put the dirt at an angle in the bucket, right, like this. And then when you put water in it, the hole will self-level the water, right? So then the female mason bee can come in and decide how wet she wants her mud, which is kind of cool, right? And then you don't have to worry about always checking all the time because you will have mud for your mason bee. If you don't have mud for her, she's just gonna go to a whole nother location because again, she doesn't have a whole um, colony. She's solitary. So she'll, she'll just go to um, another area. So you want to keep her on your property. 
Oh yeah, another thing is mason bees will only fly 300 feet from their hive or a football field. So it's another reason why they're great pollinators because you can really keep them on uh, your land and your crops that you want them on. Ah, oh, cocoons. This is like what the happy part is, right? So, uh, and I see you all smiling because you agree. So this is kind of cool because um, these uh, mason bee cocoons, there's actually males and females here. The females are larger, right? And the reason is because eggs take up more room in our bodies and then uh, consequently the, the males are smaller, right? So uh, yeah, so these are the mason bee cocoons and there are different ways that you can put them out. All right, so, oh yeah, this is interesting. So um, it takes three days of 50 degree or warmer temperatures. The males hatch out first, a few days up to two weeks later, the females hatch out and then they immediately mate. This is a really cool picture over here. Oh, hold on, page up. All right, so this is a really kind of cool picture because, all right, again, in the big picture, that's the male, right? He's got the long antennas and the furry face. And it's fascinating um, that the males that you see over here in this other picture, you can tell that they're males again because the long antennas, they actually stay around the cocoons and they start clinging on to the female cocoons. And I think we really underestimate the olfactory senses of bees, right? I bet that that male can smell the female that's in that cocoon because otherwise he would just leave. He'd be like, woohoo, you know, I hatched out my cocoon or emerged from my cocoon, it's time to go. But instead they really start grabbing on, which is uh, kind of neat. So like I said, once they emerge, they immediately mate. They mate on the ground, uh, whereas with honeybees, they mate midair. Uh, so this is Osmia cornifrons. And then here's a picture of uh, Osmia lignaria mating. Uh, but yeah, just pretty cool. And they mate with multiple males. Um, <coughs> this uh, is just a really great graphic kind of showing the, the life cycle of a mason bee. And I put this up. Um, because I imagine some of you might uh, review this video and be like, when are certain things supposed to happen? So you could look at this graphic. All right, so uh, here they mate um, and the mason bees live for about 30 days, right? The female lays uh, like one egg per day, sometimes two, but mostly one egg, right? So she uh, goes out, um, uh, she mates, she lays an egg. Oh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, after she mates, she has to decide what tube she wants, right? Like where she's gonna set up her hive, right? Or her, her, her nest. So what she does is she decides on one and then she starts cleaning it up out, right? And she actually uses her bee spit uh, to clean it out. And she's using her little mandibles and everything. So while she's cleaning, leaving her bee spit behind, then it smells like her. So that's how she knows that it's her tunnel, which is pretty fabulous. So then she uh, lays an, a baby in there, then, uh, or she collects pollen, right? And she does like 35 collection trips of pollen. She mixes that with a little bit of nectar, puts that in there, lays an egg on it. And then, like I said, she collects some mud, plugs up where she lays, laid that baby, sleeps in the tunnel overnight, next day does the same thing. She basically lays one egg per day for 30 days, and then she dies, right? How fascinating that her whole life is, is uh, that moment of time. Now, interestingly though, um, there was this one researcher that found that um, with optimal conditions of tons of nesting tubes and tons and tons of food flowers, right? Um, he documented one bee making nine cells and nine bee babies in 24 hours, right? So tremendously productive. So the reason why I'm telling you this is flowers are the key. Got to have forage. So on my website, blossommeadow.com, there is a mason bee forage webpage on there that gives you a list of all of the plants that mason bees love, right? So then by mid or really end of June, right? Once you stop seeing uh, bees fly, you want to put them into an organza bag, right? Which we have here, right? So, um, and I'll go into more reasons why that's the case though. But when you take them out of 
the uh, bead cottage, you want to always hold them up, right? And so the openings of the tube are up. The reason is that you want to make sure that the bee baby stays on the food, right? And the food went in first, and then the bee baby's on top. So leaving it like this, you, you got it covered, right? So then you put the organza bag over it. This bag goes over it, right? Like it goes in. And then you want to cinch it up. And then you're going to put it back into your bee cottage, right? Right like that, okay? And then you're going to bring it in at the end of October to our Mason Bee Cocoon Harvest Party. Uh, and if you can't come to it, we do have directions on how you can harvest your own Mason Bee Cocoons. But it's always fun to come to the party, which now is over three weeks. Uh, because um, it's gotten so big, but also because of COVID on top of it. Uh, now, with the, with the mason bee uh, reeds, it's very easy to open them. I'll show, you, uh, I'll show you here. So you just do it by hand. You squeeze the top part, and then you break it open, right? So it's really easy to do. And uh, then you, you uh, just kind of pluck them out, and then we rinse them in a dilute bleach solution for about two minutes. And then we rinse them in fresh water and then uh, just kind of roll them in um, a dry rag. And then you store them in a, um, a humidity or something like this in your refrigerator at four degrees centigrade, 50% humidity, which is essentially what your um, uh, refrigerator crisper is. Now, you never want to put apples in that refrigerator crisper as well, because of course they give off ethylene gas uh, when they're ripening, and you don't want to gas your bees after all that work. Now, uh, we'll go over why you harvest your cocoons in a second, but you should also know that now, by harvesting your bees, you are a farmer. This is your livestock, right? And you are now a farmer, you're a rancher, and because of that, you can sell back your bees to Blossom Meadow Farm, right? So we buy back your cocoons at 50 cents a cocoon, cash. And, uh, you know, or you can, of course, hibernate them yourselves. But I think it's really kind of cool to think that we are turning back the hands of time and all of us are becoming farmers again, and then hopefully becoming a more close-knit society again. So, uh, and it is kind of fun. I mean, there are some people that walk out of here with like 250 bucks, right? And they always go to uh, a swanky dinner afterwards, right? But, uh, you know, I like to be a farmer, have fun, right? All right, so um, why you would want to harv um, harvest and clean your cocoons. Uh, one reason is pollen mites. So you see here, see this fluff right here? Those are pollen mites. All bees get pollen mites by, uh, visiting flowers, right? So one bee will visit a flower, some mites will fall off, and then another, they'll crawl onto another bee that's on there. And this picture right here, you'll see right here on the center of the bee, these are pollen mites. So what will happen is that, say this uh, boy bee here, right? This boy bee will emerge from its cocoon, and as it walks out of the tube, if they're not clean, right? If you don't harvest the cocoons, the one boy bee will, oh, the boys are up here. So the boy bee will emerge and it'll have to walk through those pollen mites. And then all of a sudden it'll be burdened with pollen mites for the rest of its life. So that's why we clean the bees and so you don't have as much of an issue. Because who wants to be burdened by mites? All right, so next, Houdini fly. These are a relatively new um, invasive species uh, that's here on Long Island is actually across the United States now. I think they first found it in Washington State, but uh, they're like maggots, right? And um, they're really sticky. And so by harvesting your cocoons, we uh, get rid of those sticky maggots. Yeah, maggots, what a horrible word. All right. Uh, uh, interestingly, carpet beetles, right? So um, right here, uh, our carpet beetles, and one way to not get them is by using that organza bag, right? Um, and, uh, oh yeah, we'll go over that next. Um, another uh, pest are actually cuckoo bees. And uh, here's a picture right here of a cuckoo bee. It doesn't even look like a bee, 
right? But Stellis is. And um, I actually uh, hatched this one out myself, but you can tell that these are Stellis cocoons because their frass or poo uh, looks like spaghetti, right? So whereas uh, the poo of a mason bee is actually like black, right? So they look like really short and black. So definitely different. So then uh, when you harvest your bees, if you saw this, you would chuck them, right? Or compost them, I guess, who knows? All right, um, another pest are mono wasps. And uh, here's a picture, and these are all pictures I've taken. So um, they're kind of fascinating because they have these really long ovipositors and they are, those ovipositors are so strong that they're able to insert them through mud and uh, uh, lay their eggs right into the larvae of the mason bee. I mean, you gotta like applaud them for being so sneaky. I mean, it's kind of fascinating, but uh, so yeah, um, that's why you would definitely want to harvest them. And I don't know, I just can't tell you how much happiness I get out of seeing my mason bees. Um, in the early morning when I go out, the females, they're, they're not warm enough yet, right? So they just kind of look out of their tubes and, and they just like look like they're saying, hey, Laura, you know, what's your day like, right? So, and again, they're so gentle, you don't have to worry about anybody stinging you. And in fact, I did try to get a mason bees to sting me and uh, it felt like a mosquito bite. And I actually had to like squeeze her to get her to sting me. She was fine afterwards, she didn't die because uh, the stinger is not barbed, but I mean, it was just so fascinating, right? A lot of people also come in, uh, one side note, a lot of people come in and they're like, oh, Laura, you know, what's, what's living in my nesting tube, right? So of course, like I said, it, they could be resin bees, they could be leaf cutters, they could be mason bees, um, but they also could be some, some other things. So I just wanna go over two examples of that. I have no idea what time it is, but I have two more slides. So these are grass carrying wasps, right? I'm sure you guys uh, have heard of these wasps before, but this is actually a picture from my parents' yard uh, because they didn't want to bother me, but they wanted to help the native bees. So they got this uh, great, great in quotes, um, uh, nesting uh, teardrop or whatever. I got to tell you, no North American bee will lay their eggs in this contraption that my parents bought. Now, the reason is because these holes are too big, right? It's kind of like you don't want to buy a huge McMansion because it's just too many bathrooms to clean, right? You want a small house because it fits you. So, so no North American bee is going to lay their eggs in holes that are that large. I mean, a mason bee would have to collect like two or three times the amount of mud just to plug up where she laid one baby. But a creature that will live in this are grass-carrying wasps. So on the bottom here, you'll see a cross section of uh, grass carrying wasp babies. And um, if you, this fluffy part right here, this is actually the baby itself. And if you took that out, you would actually see um, little uh, pieces of like ants and other insects, right? Because wasps are um, uh, carnivores, right? So they feed their babies insects, right? Whereas Bees are vegetarians, right? So they eat pollen as their protein source. So wasps, uh, carnivores, bees, vegetarians. And then um, also, this is kind of interesting, these are potter wasps. Now, um, when you look at the, the top of your uh, tube, right? Mud that's chunky is a mason bee uh, tube. If you see that it's smooth on top, those are actually potter wasps that are living in there because wasps will sonicate the mud similar to how a um, uh, person makes a sidewalk and they shake the concrete to bring the milk to the top, right? Uh, to make it smooth. So the wasps are the same way. They'll make the mud smooth. So you can tell whether it's a wasp versus a mason bee. So, uh, those are all of my slides. So Laura, I'm just gonna kick off the first question. Um, 
And let's say I am super excited to have mason bees, but I don't really want to have a cottage on my property. Like I just don't want to do it. What are some native plants I could plant that are really good habitats for mason bees? For mason bees? Mm -hmm. All bees. Or maybe all other solitary native bees. Sure. So uh, I, for a tree, I love Eastern red bud. So, uh, which oh, is- Oh, they're so pretty. Yeah, you want to get Circus canadensis, which is the Eastern red bud. You don't want to get the one that's the Chinese red bud. Mm -hmm. uh, but the great thing about them is that not only are the flowers so pretty and they bloom right from the bark uh, and the great pink purple color, um, but they're in the legume family. So you can actually eat the flowers and you can put them on your salads, which I think is pretty fabulous. Um, and I, uh, you know, who doesn't love flowers in the spring? Um, another uh, plant, not necessarily uh, for mason bees, even though they have proven to go to mason bees, is definitely uh, the butterfly milkweed, uh, like you were saying. There's three different species of milkweed that are native to Long Island. And um, the reason why I like butterfly milkweed is because it only, it has nice orange flowers. It only, uh, it's drought tolerant. The deer don't like to eat it because of the sappiness of the leaves. Uh, and it, it uh, grows to about a foot and a half. Uh, yeah, 1.5 1, 1. feet to two feet tall. Um, so it has, uh, it's good for garden borders. Um, another great one to me is uh, um, spice bush, right? Spice bush is also, um, deer don't like to eat it, right? And it is a host to the spice bush swallowtail butterfly. Uh, so kind of cool that um, it has that as well. Oh, I really like American hollies too. Forget the arborvitae. I can't stand arborvitae. I mean, it, it has no <laughs> ecological value, right? It just, just doesn't flower, it's so boring. So instead, if you want a hedge, plant an American holly because it blooms and it has the, the berries uh, for migrating birds to get nice and chubby for the winter, right? And uh, they found that over time, you know, since it's a slower growing plant, you can actually increase the value of your home by planting nicer uh, things around, right? And also the pointiness of the leaves, the deer uh, will have a harder time eating it. Uh, look, deer are a big problem out here. I don't know if it necessarily is where you guys are, but I always have that as like one of my top things of why I'm gonna plant something. Uh, so yeah, those are just three off the top of my head. Great, thank you so much. And surprisingly, we have deer in Northport. So yeah, they, great. we can't hide from here. So Sarah, um, just first of all, before we go to the chat, anyone else have any questions or Sarah can go right to the chat and read those off. All right, oh, so. There was yeah. thing I, uh, one thing uh, that I think I saw. Um, with the cocoons, um, you would want to, for uh, like the bee cottage has 25, the, it's basically the starter kit, which is uh, 25, um, sorry, there are 50 uh, nesting reeds here, which would mean that your, your maximum recommended stocking rate for mason bees on this would be two females uh, for every three males. So it'd be 25 females and 37 males, right? So for a total of 62 bees, right? So the reason why you want two females for every three males is because you want to make sure that your um, females are well mated, right? And um, I give folks the uh, cocoons, people pick up the cocoons from us here at the end of March, uh, but you have to put in your reservations soon because I always um, uh, sell out. And the mason bees will come in a box like this, right, that has a cap. And then what you do is you bring this box home, you take the cap off, and then you will actually put the uh, box into the bee cottage with the, the, the top off facing it backwards. Now, the reason why you wanna face it backwards is that you want the bees to have tons of residence time on these reeds, right? Like you go into somebody's house, right? And you're in their foyer. And at first you're like, damn, I, I cannot live here, right? It just doesn't feel right. But then while you're standing there longer and longer, you're like, you know what? 
if that wall was painted blue and that sofa was in the garage instead of in the living room, yeah, I, I could dig this place, right? And so the bees are the same way. So you wanna face them backwards so then they have lo a longer time on this whole area. If you put the, the uh, facing, uh, the box facing outwards, the bees might just emerge and then fly away, right? So the goal is here, is staying here the longest. All right. And I think what we're gonna do is we'll email everybody all the links to Laura's site. So if you want to order the whole kit or if you just want cocoons, whatever it is, you'll have all that information so you guys can contact Laura and, and do that directly with her. So Sarah, what questions did you see in the chat? Well, a lot of comments, just everybody really loves it. But um, your YouTube channel, can you share that with everybody or oh. can we email that? Yeah. Um, so I just link everything onto my, um, my website. My website has okay. a video section, and so everything's right there. So okay. I, if you look up Blossom Meadow Farm on YouTube, you'll find it. <laughs> There's not that much on it because I put everything onto my website, so. Okay, and like Nicole said too, we'll be following up with an email, so everybody will get that in an email. We have a question. Uh, Bridget, is too embarrassed to say it, so I'll say it for her. But he was wondering, um, how how do you get rid of potter wasps, or do you not get rid of them? Are they are they fine? You know, like is there a disadvantage to having them? And if if they are there and you don't want them, can you get rid of them? Yeah, good question. Um, I was doing some monitoring work at Halleck State Park uh, to see what creatures were there, and I found a lot of potter wasps. And so um, being an ecologist and just like, I don't know, and being a former brownie, come on, you know, I, it, it's about embracing all of these creatures. And, and that's what's so fun. So uh, just like um, last year, we had a fox that was eating our strawberries and, uh, you know, I was totally cool with it, right? Because it's, it's all of these interactions that um, make things enjoyable. So there is a place for wasps and wasps are actually pollinators too. It's just that they're not very furry, so they're not too good at pollinating. Uh, another side thing is, it's interesting since flies are pollinators, uh, if you're a carrot farmer, you love flies because what carrot farmers do is they actually take a cage and put it over each individual carrot flower and then take blue bottle flies and put them in the cage to pollinate the flower, right? Because uh, bees do not like being caged, but a fly doesn't. So um, I say embrace it all to tell you the truth. But um, with those pests that I was talking about with the mason bees, definitely put the organza bag on and harvest your cocoons. I will um, second that with Laura. So my last, this last summer with my mason bees, I did not have the chicken wire up. That's something I learned new since I recontacted with Laura and I did not use my bag. So because I didn't use my bag, um, I had the pleasure, so to speak, I, once I came to terms with it, of staring out my window during my Zoom calls all summer with COVID and watching the woodpeckers just peck away at each reed eating all the mason bees until all the reeds were out of the mason house. So. I mean, at first I was super angry and I used to yell at them, but then I was like, well, I mean, I'm feeding my woodpeckers and they're super cool too. So uh, the bag is definitely an essential. Anyone else, questions, comments? I have a question. Sure. Um, since the bees, the mason bees, you said don't stray more than like 300 feet from mm -hmm. their home tubes. I'm wondering how you, have bees for hire and bring them to other farms and, and let them do their thing? Good question. So um, uh, I have the cocoons, right? And I actually bring, I set up the bee cottages and I bring the cocoons out to the farm, right? But you want to put the bees out when there's already 5% bloom in the, the field, right? because you wanna have some food for them to go to. So it's a real stressful dance, honestly, um, because you know, the weather has such an effect. So um, 
people pick up their mason bees from me at the end of March and they set up reservation times and everything. It used to be that people would pick up their cocoons uh, second and third week in April. But what I found is that that's too late now, right? In comparison to when we first started doing this because uh, the weather warms up so quickly. So especially closer to the city versus uh, North Fork versus even South Fork uh, with the Atlantic Ocean having such an effect on the weather on the South Fork. They, they're a little bit later than the North Fork is. So yeah, you have to bring the cocoons out um, and what I do is if the apricots, you know, they're the first things that a first fruit tree that blooms. And um, if the farmer calls me up and is like, Laura, they're, they're blooming right now. I actually will take some cocoons and I'll warm them up uh, in my closet. I'll put them, you know, close to a, a warmer area. And um, you can actually hear the cocoons, uh, the mason bees chewing out their cocoons. Oh it goodness. sounds like Rice crispy Treats. It's so fascinating, actually. And so now um, I, I used to count the cocoons on my dining room table because that's what dining room tables are definitely for. But um, too many mason bees were emerging, right? Because it was warm in the dining room. And then I would have to be like, what are you doing? And then like stick them quickly in the refrigerator. So now I do it in the, um, in the barn. But these bees uh, are... They respond to temperature, but it's fascinating how they also have an internal body clock. So the two things combined. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Hey, Sarah, do you see any other questions come through? Cisa has a question. I've got a question. And then there's another one in the chat too. Oh, fun. Um, Laura, thank you. You got me so excited about bees. It's I'm so already easy. on your website. I'm like, how do I do this? What do I do? <laughs> I see that your brat is sold out and like so where do I get like a cottage like how do I how do I start oh yeah um what did you say sold out it says the mason bees for brat is that oh what? oh yeah so um uh people put in their reservations for mason bees with me and then I some people like to pay ahead of time so then I put a custom listing up and then that's so Ed bought his bees essentially um, so since they're livestock, um, I don't like people to pay like months in advance, right? Because I want to make sure that your livestock is healthy when you get it. So now I'm very confident looking at all the cocoons and uh, my husband kicked me out of the uh, refrigerator actually. So now I have my own refrigerator. Uh, so, but everybody's looking really good. Um, so yeah, so people, um, I still have bees for sale. And so they're $1.50 a cocoon. Um, and again, it's two females for every three males. Um, and please, everybody, uh, I have a Mason Bee newsletter, which is really only four emails a year. I'm like so proud of myself when I send one out. But um, that I like to send people the latest, um, you know, papers on Mason Bees and, and climate change related to Mason Bees and that kind of thing. Um, and so, if you email me uh, at laura at blossommeadow.com, there's also the contact form on my website. Um, I'll put you on our newsletter list, uh, which I just sent one out, I think last week. But I have the bee cottages available for sale here in Kuchog, Um, and you can pick one up when you pick up your cocoons. Um, so if you email me saying you want how many females and how many males, then within 48 hours, I send you an email back confirming your reservation with more information. Okay. So, yeah. You, um, when I was asked to give this talk, I was like, oh, the timing works out well because I still have mason bees. So, um, so yeah, y'all are good if, if you want to ranch this year. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I just don't put the bee cottages on my website for sale because it's too difficult to send a bee cottage through the mail. I mean, I love the post office and all, but you know, it's just like a lot to package it up and stuff. Laura, Joanna's daughter in the chat asked a question. She said, how do you attract the bees? That's from yeah. Amelia. That's awesome. Okay, so, Everybody, like I was saying, just like with humans, 
everybody's looking for a nice place to live. And, and that's all it is, right? You could put a bee cottage up and uh, see who comes and lives in it, right? You don't have to get cocoons, but you can jumpstart your bee ranching effort by getting cocoons. But it's just like people, you know? I mean, granted they're insects and we are humans and you shouldn't really anthropomorphize everything, but really <coughs> everybody's just looking for a nice place to live. So, um, and, and that's how, um, you know, um, species increase their ranges, right? So, um, oh, and another big thing is pesticide use. Um, if you use pesticides, since we underestimate the olfactory senses of bees, if you use pesticides, those bees might leave your property, right? So they might go to another place and, and uh, start a whole new community there. Thank you. Well, thank you so any much, other? you guys. Sure, I was just going to ask, any other questions? I have. Um, I have a question. If one of the purposes of the initiative is to attract monarch and they feed on milkweed, they cluster towards milkweed pretty, you know, instinctively. I don't know that there's much milkweed where I'm at, the elevation of 7,000 feet in Colorado, but how prevalent is milkweed, you know, population around the country? And, uh, do you know, what are the initiatives to increase that going on? Do you know? Right, so um, definitely the monarch butterfly population has been decimated. I think it's declined by 80% over the last two decades. I mean, as we were all kids, there were so many more than there are now, just anecdotally. Um, so there's two different monarch populations. There's the Western population and the Eastern population. And uh, Eastern population overwinters in the oil and mill forests of Mexico, and then, uh, they actually like once they finish overwintering in those forests, then they mate and start laying eggs. And then they follow the milkweed growing up the east coast of the United States and keep on having successive generations. Uh, on Long Island, they make it here pretty much third week in June, uh, although give and take given the weather. And then they have three generations on Long Island. The first two generations, uh, once they emerge from their cocoons, they mate and immediately lay eggs. The third generation that emerges in September, October timeframe, uh, they actually stay sexually immature and then they're the ones that fly down to Mexico and overwinter again. Um, definitely one of the biggest reasons uh, why monarch butterflies have declined so much is because there's not enough milkweed anymore. And when I read a paper in 2017 about how in order for the population to rebound, we needed, I think it's 1.7 billion more milkweed plants, or maybe it was 1.3, I think it's 1.7 billion more milkweed plants, which is why we started the Home Merlot for Monarchs campaign. Uh, even though we're small, you know, everybody needs to make a difference. So, so far we've planted uh, like over 2,000 milkweed plants through our small project. But uh, yeah, it's a problem, right? I mean, I don't know. It, at least, you know, granted climate change, a lot of other issues, pesticides, but to think that I can plant a milkweed plant and then see caterpillars, it's, it's so fabulous. And so um, out in the front of our tasting room, I have two small patches of milkweed. And uh, two years ago, I had 250 caterpillars just off a small patch to the point that uh, I would take off the caterpillars and bring them home to our farm because there wasn't enough milkweed here for them. And it was so fabulous to see uh, people come into our tasting room. And at first some would be shocked that I had caterpillars inside the tasting room because hey, they're here to drink wine and they never thought they would see a caterpillar while they're doing that. But then you see that through time, they're so fascinated by watching them eat, right? Like we're part of nature. Like, you know, and all of a sudden, it's just like, sometimes they're like scared of nature and then they're like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm part of it, right? Just like we shouldn't have to drive to see nature, we should plant things around us so we can like be part of it, right? So um, yeah, the higher altitudes, I don't think you guys have milkweed there, but the lower altitudes, I know you do. Um, of the three species that grow on Long Island, 
Uh, Asclepius syriaca, which is the common milkweed, is the one that they uh, selectively lay their eggs on in comparison to the other two species, which is butterfly milkweed and swamp milkweed. Um, and they think they like the common milkweed better because it has more sap in the leaves. But, you know, not everybody wants a four foot milkweed plant in their backyard. So that's why I've kind of like made it butterfly milkweed as part of the project. So, but cool stuff, right? <laughs> I don't know. They just make me smile. <laughs> well, thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate this. This has definitely been a highlight of my winter vacation. So I appreciate well, we it. We really thank you so much Laura, you. for coming on and sharing this information with us. Thanks for kicking off our lecture series with uh, Northport Native Garden Initiative.